diving into the first part, chapter 3, the first part of Paul's letter to the churches in Ephesus in chapter 3. If you have not yet had the chance to listen to the previous three messages, I cannot urge you or encourage you enough to go back, check those out either on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. Last week's message, entitled The Transcultural Church, is especially relevant to us as a family of believers who define ourselves as transcultural. And so family, I really cannot urge you enough to go back and take a listen or a watch of those first three messages in this series, if you missed any of them. With that being said, I'm going to begin reading our text from God's Word today. But before I do that, I'd also invite us all to stand as we prepare to hear these life-giving words from the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that as I read these words, the Holy Spirit would take hold of them, would take hold of these words that are being spoken, and that the Spirit would stir them up in our hearts. Amen? So let's hear from Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13, from the Christian Standard Bible, or the CSB. Of course, you can follow along in your own Bibles or on your electronic devices. And we're going to have it up on the screen. There it is. That's Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you, the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written above. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not made known to people in other generations, as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of His power. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to His eternal purpose, accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him we have a boldness and confident access through faith in Him. So then, I ask you, not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. Family, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to God. Y'all can take a seat. Uh, as I pray for us, and as I pray for this message, as, the rest, as well as the rest of our time together. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, as we have gathered as a family here at Rooted Fellowship, Lord, we have sung your praises. O Jesus, our King, we have sung that you are indeed worthy and you are indeed holy. You are completely set apart. Now, Father in heaven, you are indeed the Lord, our God. You are robed in everlasting light. Your glory floods the earth and it fills the skies, almighty God. O good, good Father, there is none like you. Jesus, as we prepare to delve deeper into this, your word, Lord, we want to say, our life is yours. We come to you saying, our life is yours. Everything is yours. Our heart is yours. Lord, every step of our journey is yours. And so, Lord, as you knew that we'd be here today, as you knew that we'd be listening or watching this message, and so we ask, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and open our hearts, open our minds, our eyes, our ears and our lives to your word today. We ask you to come and have your way. Come and have your way, Lord. Come and speak, Lord. We ask that you would bring your comfort as we reflect on these, your holy, powerful words. Would you make us more like you, Jesus? May we be more like you. Father, I ask that you would come and use me now to speak your truth and to build your church for your glory, Lord all for your glory and for our good. And all of this we pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Okay, 
So as a bit of an intro, uh, I'd like us to think of the book of Ephesians being kind of split up into two halves. Okay, so the book of Ephesians split up into two halves. Chapters 1 to 3 form part 1, and then chapters 4 to 6 form part 2. A uh, well-known theologian, Paul David Tripp, describes the first three chapters of Ephesians as describing the gospel's roots. And as we are still in chapter 3 today, we are still in the first half of this book. And in this half, Paul is exploring the roots or the story of the gospel. How all of history comes to fulfillment in Jesus and in his formation of his transcultural community of followers. The second half lays out the gospel's fruit. The gospel's fruit. But for that, you're going to have to wait and see. Keep coming back or tracking with us in order to find out what Paul says about the fruits of the gospel in the second half of the book of Ephesians. Or even better, family, I invite you to read ahead. Uh, not now, though, please. We need to focus on this. Okay. But later today, go ahead. Then, just another small recap. Uh, remember, in chapters 1 and 2, Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. Paul says that God the Father has unified all things in heaven and on earth. We saw this in chapter 1, verse 10. God has unified all things in heaven and on earth under Jesus Christ. And so Paul praises him for the fact that because of Jesus, anyone, somebody say anyone. Now, everybody say anyone. Yes, indeed, family. Paul praises God for the fact that because of Jesus, anyone, regardless of culture, background, status or qualifications anyone can be adopted into God's family and this is because Jesus' death covers all of his followers worst sins and failures and in Jesus we find God's forgiveness and grace amen and we saw this we saw this in the first two chapters of Ephesians that God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings from not just the Jewish nation but actually from every tribe and nation who are all unified in Jesus the Messiah. Some of y'all will remember from last week that Pastor One mentioned God's words found in Isaiah 56 verse 7, which says, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. All nations. God's house is for all nations. The Apostle Paul starts Ephesians by beautifully unpacking in chapters 1 and 2 who we collectively are in Christ. Who we are collectively in Christ. Christians are one body from all nations, but we are united into one new community. Amen? And now, in chapter 3, Paul somewhat changes gears as he begins talking about his very own personal situation. And then... Paul prepares to pray for the church in Ephesus in light of the gospel's good news that he has just reminded them about in the previous two chapters. And so that's where we're going to start to take a a deeper dive into our text. At the beginning of chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says this. He says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Okay, so here, right at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul says that because of the amazing gospel news that he's just laid out in the first two chapters, he, he wants to now pray for the church in Ephesus. So he writes, for this reason. In other words, because of all the good news I've just described to you in the first two chapters, I would now like to respond with a prayer. And then Paul writes that he is writing from his place in prison, or this position in prison. And then it's as if he stops, he pauses, He changes his direction, and he delays his prayer. Okay, he delays his prayer, which then he only actually prays in verses 14 to 21. You can look ahead and see that Paul begins verse 14 with the same words, for this reason. But why? Why does Paul delay his prayer at this moment? It's because, you see, family, the church in Ephesus would have seen Paul's imprisonment or his position in prison as a defeat. This would have been terribly, terribly discouraging to them. Ephesus was an incredibly spiritual city, so many people would have heard the gospel news, they would have turned away from their dead religions, they would have turned away from their idols, 
and turn towards Jesus. But now, hearing that Paul was in, was in this position in jail, they would have thought, sure, if that's the case, then I wonder if God is all that powerful. And now as you hear this, you might be thinking, Woof, they had such little faith. But if we're being honest, family, we also see our hardships in our own lives as God's defeat, don't we? We see hardships in our own lives as God's defeat. And so that's why Paul pauses and he doesn't pray just yet. Instead, he begins to pen words that will help them and us see that Paul's position actually reveals, or rather, it confirms his purpose. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you. Now, in these verses 1 and 2, Paul firstly identifies himself as a prisoner, and then on the one hand, this is quite obvious, right? It's, it's obvious, because he's writing this letter whilst imprisoned. But he was also a prisoner for the sake of the Ephesian Gentiles, the Christians in Ephesus who were not previously Jewish. He was a prisoner for their sake too. You see, fam, it's because of Paul's ministry to these very Gentile believers that he has actually been imprisoned. That's why he's in prison, because of his ministry to these Gentile believers. You see, Paul was under house arrest in Rome for preaching Christ to Jews and Gentiles. And the religious leaders in Jerusalem, which remember, was under Roman rule at this time, well, these leaders rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, along with all of his teachings. And these leaders are now pressuring the Romans to arrest Paul. They've pressured them to arrest Paul and bring him to trial for treason, because he's been causing rebellion among the Jews. But Paul, being a Roman citizen, he's now appealed his case to be heard by the emperor, and as he writes these words, he's awaiting trial. And so Paul identifies himself as a prisoner. But, family, do not miss it. In another sense, Paul wants his audience to hear that he was in actual fact a prisoner of Jesus Christ because he had been so captured by the beauty and the wonder and the splendor of the saving grace of the gospel. Paul had made Jesus the ruler and Lord of his life at all times and in all places. And so as a humble and willing servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul was given the special work of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And he wants them then and us today to see this clearly. Paul had received a special administration or a special equipping from God's grace to do this work. And so Paul acknowledges that he's been given a special purpose of preaching the good news to the Gentiles. And so now he goes on to share more about this, about, about his purpose in verses 3 to 9. We pick it up there. Verses 3 to 9. Paul is going to double-click his purpose. Verse 3. The mystery was made known to me by, by revelation, as I have briefly written above. Now here in verse 3, Paul is talking about the mystery which God had revealed to him and the one in which he had already mentioned, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Namely, the mystery that God will one day unite all things in Christ. We also saw this in chapter 2 when Paul detailed how Jesus, how, sorry, how the Jews and Gentiles have already been united in Christ. That's the mystery. But what's important to take note of, fam, is that Paul didn't learn of this mystery from any man or any school or textbook because he was so intelligent or learned, which Paul certainly was. But no, rather this gospel mystery was made known to him by God himself. The gospel mystery was made known to Paul by God himself. God had appointed him for this purpose. Paul then says to the believers in Ephesus in verse 4, he says, by reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, after these readers had read everything prior to this in his letter, they certainly would have known that Paul had insight into this mystery of Christ as head over all things, and that in Christ, Jews and Gentiles are united into one body, namely the church. But... But Paul says this in verse 5. This mystery was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
What Paul is saying here, fam, is that the mystery of all things being united in Christ was not fully revealed to those who lived before Jesus' time on earth. Only once Jesus had risen from the dead was this mystery fully revealed to God's appointed messengers in the power of the Holy Spirit, which was sent out at Pentecost. Family, do not miss this. God's plan was hidden from previous generations, not because God wanted to keep something from his people, but rather because he would reveal it in his perfect timing. You see, family, God planned to have all nations, Jews and Gentiles, form part of one body known as the church. It was written in the Old Testament that the Gentiles would receive salvation. We see this throughout the Old Testament and in the major prophet Isaiah's book specifically. But now we have Paul here detailing the good news that Gentile and Jewish believers are completely equal in the body of Christ. And this equality was firmly established in Jesus. And so Paul goes on to elaborate more on this in verse 6. He says, The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now here in this verse, Paul once again states this mystery. And so we should be getting the idea that this is a pretty huge deal. Okay? Gentile believers have become co-heirs or family with Jewish believers. Jewish and Gentile Christians are one in Christ and completely equal in God's sight. There is no upper and lower class Christian. And make no mistake, many Jewish believers, that is Christians who were once Jews, they considered the Gentile believers to be of a lower class. But here, in these very verses, Paul is strenuously emphasizing that all have become one. All Christians are now God's very own special people and fellow citizens in God's kingdom. And the Gentile believers have a completely equal, co-heird claim to the covenant that God established with Israel. Remember, family, God had promised the Jews that he would send them a savior, a rescuer, But as we read in the gospel accounts, when that Savior Jesus came, he was rejected by most Jews. But God made Christ's salvation work available to all who would receive Jesus. And in this way, Gentile believers also share in the promise of salvation. All believers share in the promise of salvation. Continue on, verse 7. Verse 7, Paul says, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. You see, friends and family, Paul's purpose was to be an instrument of the gospel as a gift of God's grace and through God's power. Paul's purpose was to be an instrument of the gospel as a gift of God's grace and through God's power. But friends and family, all of us who believe in Jesus have been made instruments of the gospel through the grace and power of God. Amen? God has equipped us and empowered us as well. And so it begs the question, let's maybe take a moment to pause and reflect on this. Whose instrument are we? Brother and sister, whose instrument are we? As we live out our everyday lives, Whose instruments are you? Who do we spend the most time serving at home? Who do we spend the most time serving at work, at school, at college, on the weekends? Do we seek to serve ourselves or our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Whose name and kingdom are we out there online and socially trying to build? You see, when Paul became an instrument of the gospel, God supernaturally gave him the ability to share the gospel effectively. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I are not apostles in the sense that we were sent out and equipped by Jesus to establish the New Testament church and author much of the New Testament some 2,000 years ago. Okay? That's not us. But I have no doubt that God has a purpose for us too. He has appointed you and He has appointed me to tell others about the love of Jesus. And so God will provide us with those opportunities, the courage and the power. But family, we do need to make ourselves available. 
And so it's my prayer right now that the Holy Spirit would come and reveal someone in our lives, in our everyday lives, that God is calling us to share Jesus' love with right now. Come Holy Spirit, reveal someone in our lives who you are calling us to share your, the good news of the Jesus Christ to. You see, family, as we focus on the needs of those God, God is calling us to reach out to, God will use us to communicate His love for those in desperate need of a Savior. Are we making ourselves available? And then Paul says this in verse 8. He says, This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. Notice, family, that Paul doesn't exalt himself, but instead he exalts his calling or his purpose in Christ. He defines this special work as proclaiming the incalculable riches to the Gentiles. Paul knows that Christ's riches are spiritual in nature and that they are incalculable. They are without limits and they are without number. These are the most precious riches we could ever fathom. Eternal life with our Heavenly Father. Eternal life with our Heavenly Father. And so Rooted Fellowship, when we are out outside of this place, living our everyday lives, are these incalculable riches reflected in the way that we live out our lives? Do we live in light of eternity? When we're out there engaging the world, do we share the good news about these incalculable riches, our glorious inheritance? Perhaps, as you sit here today, you maybe have never heard of these riches before. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. Friend, to you I say, do you want to receive these riches? Salvation in Jesus Christ, eternal life secured, the blessing of His Holy Spirit in your life, and countless spiritual blessings are yours when you come to Jesus. And just as a bit of a plug, to find out more about more of these spiritual blessings, please join us next week as Pastor Kenny unpacks Paul's prayer in Ephesians verses 14 to 21 in chapter 3. But friend, if that's you today, if you're thinking, man, I want to receive these incalculable riches, then I've got some good news for you. In fact, I have the good news for you. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if that's something that you'd either like to pray with someone or maybe share with someone, then please do stick around after the gathering to either pray or share with someone up here up front because we'd love to connect with you. But to the family, to the believers in this room, I ask, I ask you and I ask me, are we blown away by these riches enough to really want to share this news and this inheritance with others? Are we, or are we perhaps like a guest invited to a great banquet who sits down at the table but does not partake in the great feast set before them. Family, let's reflect on the world for a moment, if we may. The way of this world is to seek after riches that spoil. The way of this world is to seek after riches that spoil. But in Jesus, Christians have found riches that will most certainly last forever. We have a relationship with the Lord and Savior of all. We have Jesus himself, and so... Are we not compelled to tell others the good news? Because if, we are, if we're being brutally honest here, and now I'm preaching to my own heart, honestly, fam, often we act like in Jesus, we don't have many riches at all. We think and say things like, we're a bit small. We're a small church. There's mega churches out there. What kind of impact can we really have at work, at school, at play? We're so small, or we're so insignificant, or we're so, insert whatever negative quality you want to lean on. Family, how can the people of God who possess the unsearchable riches of Christ and who are empowered by God's grace and Holy Spirit, how can we be anything other than confidently and powerfully on mission? Amen? We have enough spiritual wealth and power in the Holy Spirit to share with folks that are brought along our path. And so here in this verse, Paul describes himself as the least of all the saints. But he's not being self-deprecating or falsely humble. 
because this was a man who previously persecuted Christ's church. No, instead, he's saying that without God's help, he would never be able to do God's work. But God, but God chose him and gave him a purpose to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And God also gave him the power to do it. And so brothers and sisters this morning, for whatever time you're listening to or watching this, I'm telling you that God has a purpose for us too. He has chosen us to tell others about Jesus as well. And he will supply us with the power through the power of the Holy Spirit. He will supply us with the power through the Holy Spirit. And in doing this, we will be able to share the good news. Brother and sister, do not be fooled into thinking that you have no part in the Great Commission or that you only have a small, insignificant role. God wants to use you. He has a part for you to play. And so this morning, I pray that you would draw on His power and faithfully fulfill the specific role that God has for you in spreading His kingdom. We then head into verse 9. Paul writes this, he says, Grace was given to him to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul acknowledges that together with preaching to the Gentiles, he was appointed by God to make plain to everyone the administration of the mystery. Paul was appointed to establish much of God's early global church, united in their faith in Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And here, in this verse, Paul describes his driving desire to help every believer see the personal role we all have in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, fellow believer, the question before us is, what are we doing in respect to this mission? You see, we've seen this. All believers are called to be part of this mission. But our assignments may look different. Sure, Paul's look different to Peter's and look different to Timothy's, for example. But we all have a part to play. Friend, family, you are not called to plant this church, right? Pastor One and his wife Confidence, Pastor Stephen, and some faithful others were called to do that. And they were empowered by his Holy Spirit and faithful in the carrying out of that work. And we praise God for that. But today we need to ask ourselves, what role is God calling us to play in the continual formation of this local body which joins together with God's global church? Perhaps you're you're called to tell others about Jesus and then invite them to join us on a Sunday so we can fill up the 905 gathering and fill up the 1055 gathering. And then maybe we'll start a 12 p.m. gathering, right? You guys keen? I'm seeing some some nods. 5 p.m. gathering, another one. Perhaps you're being called to get more rooted and connected here. And then to invite others to do the same. Because you see, family, when we are faithful to that calling, Paul then says this in verse 10, this is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. God's purpose in revealing the mystery of Christ as the head of the church was to show his wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the spiritual realms, which includes angels and evil spirits. Now you're probably asking, how does God show his wisdom to these spiritual beings? Well, he does this through the church. Through each and every local church, God is showing forth his multifaceted wisdom to all spiritual beings. And in fact, the Greek word that Paul uses for multifaceted is polypoikilos. Polypoikilos. And family, this word pictured God's wisdom, right? It described God's wisdom as being varied, with many shades, tints, hues, and colorful expressions. Family, as a God of variety, God the Father displays His wisdom through the diversity of His people. Amen? God the Father displays His wisdom through the diversity of His people. And so Rooted Fellowship, as a transcultural church, as a church that is not homogenous, Paul's words here are incredibly, incredibly encouraging. What we are doing here displays the multifaceted wisdom of God. Amen? What we are doing here displays the multifaceted wisdom of God. This is why we say 
when we get together, and we get together in city groups and on Sundays and family groups, when we serve in our ambassador departments, when we meet in discipleship groups, and when we gather together and sing God's praises and see the gospel transforming lives within the local church, that the devil himself quakes and trembles. Family, the church, Christ's very own body, has the power to overcome the authority of Satan. And that's because as the people of God, as the church, we are co-heirs with Christ. And so family, this local church matters. Other gospel-centered local churches spread across this city, this nation, this continent, and are spread across the entire world, they matter. And don't be fooled, family. Your participation in the local body of Christ matters. It has significant and eternal consequences. It has the ability to overcome the authority of the evil one in this fallen and broken world as we wait on King Jesus to return and make all things new. And so, with that, we then come to the product of all of this, the product in verses 11 to 13. Paul says this in 11 and 12. He says, This is according to his eternal purpose, accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Family and friends, we've seen that it was God the Father's eternal purpose that all people, all people might enter with boldness into his presence and become members of his family, the church. It is an awesome privilege to be able to approach God with freedom and confidence. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of us, if not all of us, would be a little bit apprehensive in the presence of any powerful ruler, let alone the creator and sustainer of the universe. But thanks to Jesus, by faith, we can enter directly into God's presence through prayer, and we'll know that we will be welcomed with wide open arms because we are God's children. And this was accomplished through our union with Jesus Christ, our very head of the church. Now let's think about that for a moment, family. The church, or the body of Christ, is, the, is incredibly important because it is the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. The church is the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. And this is why it is such a target of the forces of evil. We saw this last week as we broke ground and wanted to extend... Uh, more bookings to more people and have a second gathering. It was as if like everything technically was just going wrong. We couldn't explain it, right, KG? Family, this morning, this projector was giving us massive issues. The church is a target of the forces of evil because it is the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. And so family, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the product of Christ's church has been and continues to be incredibly significant in the history of of humankind. The product of Christ's church has been and continues to be incredibly significant in the history of humankind. And whilst historians of the world write about presidents, rulers, kings and queens and other famous and influential people, whilst, whilst they write about wars and peace treaties, those who wrote the Bible, the, the different books that we find in both the Old and the New Testament, these authors wrote about the chosen, perfect, redeemer and king. And they wrote about the war between Christ and Satan. They wrote about the war between good and evil. Oh, and by the way, someone needs to hear this today. I need to hear this today. In fact, we all need to hear this today. They wrote about a war which was already won by redeemer King Jesus when he defeated the forces of evil, when he died on the cross at Calvary, when he paid for our sins, and when he rose again, defeating sin and death for eternity. Amen? Historians write about the kingdoms of this world which come and go. But the authors of the Bible wrote about God's spiritual kingdom which is always gaining ground and winning souls for Jesus. And this kingdom will never ever fail. The product of this kingdom has no boundary, it has no border and it extends throughout the world as it brings light and hope family, this kingdom is the church. Amen? We come to our last verse today, and I'll bring our time to a close here as we read verse 13. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions 
on your behalf, for they are your glory. Paul tells the church in Ephesus not to be discouraged, even though he's in jail. Instead, they should focus on their unsearchable riches in Christ, which is their glory. But why should Paul's suffering make the Ephesians feel encouraged? Well, if Paul had not preached the gospel, the product would have not been his imprisonment, right? But the product would also not have been the establishment of the church in Ephesus, meaning that many Ephesians would not have heard the gospel. Family, in the same way that a mother endures the pain of childbirth in order to bring new life into the world, Paul endured the pain of persecution in order to bring new believers to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can we be real here for a moment? Honestly, as we head out into this week, honestly, obeying Jesus is not the easy option. He calls up he calls us to take up our cross and follow him, which means that we may, we may be called to endure pain, ridicule, and persecution so that God's message of salvation can reach everyone. Some of us may even be experiencing this right now as we sit and listen to this. And so to you, family, I say, in these times of trial, we may question God's love for us. Perhaps as you listen to this message and as you reflect on the challenges of sharing the gospel in your local context, as you reflect on the challenges of living out your faith, it may feel overwhelming. And, it li- and it may feel like it would just be easier to just stop. Just give in. But family, God is here today encouraging us with these words. Paul here says, take heart, fellow brothers and sisters, fellow believers in the Lord Jesus, be encouraged. Be encouraged for your hardships and struggles, just like Paul's, are only temporary. And your obedience in the midst of those struggles and hardships create testimonies which serve in drawing many, many to the throne of God. Your obedience in the midst of those struggles and hardships create testimonies which serve in drawing many, many to the throne of God through Christ Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not alone. We have a Holy Spirit. And so, family, it's my prayer that we would know this today. That as we prepare to head out and be salt and light to this world this coming week, we would know that and be encouraged. I invite you to stand as we respond in prayer. And then after that prayer, we're going to respond in song. So let's stand together and pray to the Almighty God. Oh, Heavenly Father, this morning, Lord, we have seen that we have, all of us, a unique role to play in spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. We've also seen, Lord, that we we have a unique role in participating in the family of God, in this local church. And Lord God, we've also seen that as we do this, your multifaceted wisdom is put on display to this world, but also to the spiritual world. And so, Holy Spirit, today we pray that even as we all face our own unique challenges, would you come and empower us to praise you, God the Father, for who we are in Christ Jesus. We ask that you would empower us to praise you for the privilege of being called to advance the kingdom of God, both inside and outside of the local church. And may we always treasure our relationship with you, Lord God, above everything else, above every trial and above every temptation. O Spirit, would you come now and empower us to be joyful. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Would you empower us to be joyful and obedient to you as we head out into this week? Lord God, may we be a people that continually sing of your glory. May we continue to sing of your worth and your holiness, no matter what we face. You are so, so worthy, Lord God. Worthy to be praised for eternity. And we pray this all in Jesus' beautiful and holy name. Amen and amen.